towards the fence a bit more. Hold her there. Swing towards the fence. Yeah, right there. How's it on the left side? Yeah. What's up everyone? It is Saturday morning, sun is shining, it's not minus 27 like it was yesterday with the wind, probably minus 10 or something, but bearable, and we just got called into work. Uh, it's a neighborhood, as soon as I heard the street name, I was like, oh no, underground and old, very old underground. I'm not sure what we're getting into, I could get there and it might just be the customer's breaker, might have to change the my transformer, might have bad underground mines, I don't know. So. We're gonna head that way and document the troubleshooting process, what we find, and the repairs. Here, I've got uh, 8006 SO33 open. Said 8006 SO33. Yeah, 104. This is. I'm going to uh, start going through the pad mounts there, but if you want to throw a copy on, he's going to head over this way and give me a hand. M4 Aaron, I'll show uh, 8006 SO33 open there and uh, I will put a copy on that. Uh, 10 4, thanks. 21 clear. So, normally when outages come in, when, when a customer calls, we have an automated system that associates that customer with the transformer. Another call comes in, the system automatically detects that this customer is on the same transformer. And, and at that point, the system will predict that that transformer is open. So once a customer calls that's on a different transformer but the same sideline, it'll group that together to the next switchback that feeds those transformers to sideline. If then a customer across the street or down a mile down the road calls in, it'll group those together to the next switchback and predict it could be 150 customers open or out of power even though only the three called. The system's usually not wrong. It's pretty good at predicting this stuff. It even takes into account that there could be some errors with people who live next door, and maybe there's a transformer that on the system is feeding this guy, but not this guy. Anyways, you get the point. So normally what I do in a situation like this, I go straight to the house, check the meter, especially where it's, where it's underground. I assume it's probably the customer's breaker or something. But rather than going straight to the house, the system predicted 15 customers out. And this, it's a little sideline, 15 customers, there's two pad mount transformers. So rather than head to the customer's house, I drove to the switch that feeds underground lines. And sure enough, oh man, that sun is brutal. Hang on. Yeah, I can't see nothing. So, there we go. So sure enough, the switch is open. There's a cutout there, load brake cutout. I'll try to work on that sun a little bit doors hanging open so that's that's not good if this was overhead lines two span I could do a quick patrol probably find an animal or something close up back in we'd be out of here 10 20 minutes where this is underground first thing we're gonna do is open those pad mounts honestly I'm hoping I find something hopefully I find a termination that's all blown to pieces with enough slack that we can splice on a new one if there's not we could be in a huge mess here this is all direct buried 7,200 volt lines. Going through, right where that fence is, into that neighborhood. Yeah, it's not good at all. We, if we don't find any issues in the Padmon transformers, we're gonna have to mega the cables. I'll, uh, I'll call one of our, uh, one of our sub techs down here. They got all the equipment on hand to, to mega that. So what we'll have to do is disconnect the cables on either end so if they're 100% isolated, put 5,000 volts through the cable and see what we're getting for readings. If, uh, if that amperage flies up that it's showing that there's uh, some current leakage or it's going to ground, it's a bad cable. If it's a bad cable, yeah. So this probably isn't good. I've got two guys heading right off the bat. As soon as I went to go open that pad mount transformer, where the buckle comes down, the padlock goes through, it was forced upwards. I was just in that pad mount a month ago for inspection. Everything was fine, and it was not bent like that. So, 
if there was an explosion inside, perhaps enough to force that open and bend it, could be. So that pad mount transformer is done. Uh, a lot of times, if, if the termination fails where it plugs into the pad mount, that's, there's an insert there that's removable. We can yank that out, put a new insert in. We're good to go. If I had any doubts, I could get the subtext to come by and uh, TTR that transformer, check the windings, check to see if they're still good or not, if it was an internal failure or if it was a failure on the termination. This guy here, it's old seen the way that insert was actually blown outwards too, we're not replacing that. We've got to replace that whole pad mount transformer. So how the process is gonna go, I'm gonna get a permit on that line. We'll put grounds on on the on the riser pole on the overhead. That way that elbow that's hanging there loose will be grounded. We're then gonna to have to get a crane or a boom truck or something to change that in the backyard. I'm gonna check with some surrounding property owners. I see there's a driveway on the other side we might be able to use. We'll have to check with our stores, get pad mount transformer in. Um, so I opened up that first pad mount on that sideline. Um, before even opening it, you could tell there was some damage there. The lock was jammed from, uh, from the internals exploding. So the transformer is, uh, it looks like 8006 PM 23 R10 R1A L1. Uh, that transformer is also back lot. It'll need replaced. 10-4 earrings to the 80-06 uh, PM 23-R-10-R-1-AL-1 and that's going to need replaced. Is the, the cable seems to be alright coming into it? or uh, The termination's blown apart, the insert's blown out. There's enough cable if we have to splice it we can. I think we'll be able to just remove the, uh, the elbow and just put a new elbow on. While I'm waiting for the boys to show up, I'm just trying to come up with a plan to get a truck in to change that. We're pretty lucky considering where this is a back lot job. It looks like we'll be able to get a truck right in through that customer's property. As long as that car is mobile and we'll have to put some plywood down on that grass. Even though it is winter time, it's not much frost in the ground this year. Yeah, 10 for a grid protection points being 806SO33 to the end of the line. All right, so we've got our work permit in effect. We've got our partner here going up in the air. We're gonna remove the lead on that cutout and put a ground right on the stinger going into the cutout. My other partner is back at the office with our stores guy, loading up the pad mount transformer, some plywood, and a whole lot of other material. So things should start moving along here pretty quick. One other important thing that we are gonna to have to verify, doesn't look like there's any oil leaks. The ground's pretty dry. However, that's, that's a pretty old unit, so we are going to have to verify that it is still full of oil, 41 gallons of oil, so we'll have to check that as we get going as well. The line was blown open already, of course, but when you're putting a ground on the lead right immediately at the bottom part of the cutout, you want to remove that riser, that, that lead, the wire going up from the cutout to the overhead, just because you don't have a whole lot of clearance. He was checking potential before removing the lead, just to cross-reference the potential indicator between the live and the dead side. You could have done that on the overhead wire too, of course, so that process doesn't really matter as long as you do check potential before installing that ground. It's also important to note that that's a feed through pad mount transformer. So what that means is this underground cable feeds into that transformer. There's then another elbow that takes off from that transformer to go to another one. Once we remove both those elbows, we're going to lose our ground on, on the feed through side. So as I mentioned in many videos, I, I do skip a lot of steps, otherwise this video would be six hours long, but uh, we do go over to the other pad mount and ground the opposite side. We can't ground right in the pad mount because we're going to be working on that termination. So we do ground it to prevent any back feed. Right here, he's putting the duck bill on the neutral by hand. He's not putting himself in series. 
with, with anything working out of an insulated bucket. If he was on that pole on hooks, it'd be a good idea to use your hot stick to put that even on the neutral side. Everything else in that pole is live other than that cable. The overhead primary is live, 7200 volts. You can see that street light stuck on. That's just the photo eye that's stuck open, but all that secondary low voltage stuff is also energized. We do have adapters, as we saw in a video a couple months ago, to fit into the bottom jaws of that cutout if need be. But this one here has about a four to six inch bare spot. So he's able to put that duckbill ground directly on the cable itself. You can see here, you can't quite see the transformer, but the gentleman was able to move his car out of the way. And he had no issues with us bringing some plywood, laying it down in his yard to get through. So one real important thing when you're ripping apart wiring, especially in a pad mount transformer, is you want to make sure you label everything. So it was all labeled red and blue. We just put some fresh tape on it. That stinger, that's the connection that connects from the high voltage termination in through the insert. That white tip on, that's a load brake tip. This device I'm using here, it's pretty much the most primitive way of, of installing those at proper torque. Basically that little wire that I just showed you, when you tighten that stinger, it'll bend once, once it's at proper torque. But while we're waiting for material, we don't have anything on site at all yet. So we're just kind of stripping things apart, taking a little bit better look. That termination there, you can see the termination didn't fail. The insulation's still good. Nothing's burnt, nothing's melted. The stinger on the termination itself is still in good shape, but we're going to replace the elbow, the rubber around the elbow. It's quite old. Eventually it will start to track. So you saw that termination a moment ago where there was a hole. That stinger just goes in through that rubber elbow and screws into that hole. And it's very important that that is torqued because it is aluminum. But we'll get back to that a little bit more in a sec. Before we go any further, I do want to take a minute to give a shout out to Andy. This is uh, Rooted Arborists. Andy is an ISA certified arborist. He's also an international trainer who started making some content on YouTube. I met this gentleman in Milwaukee. Um, had lunch with them, sat down with them, had quite a chat. Real awesome guy. I've been in touch with him a little bit over the last year. And I really think you guys would like his content on YouTube. So punch in Rooted Arborists into the search bar, check him out. Real cool stuff. So right here, this is the one that was on the blown side. And this termination doesn't look like the other one. In fact, it's all good. That's gonna definitely I've never seen a stinger look like that before. There's, there's no hole for the stinger to screw into. So we were a little a bit puzzled. That's just the tag that identifies the elbow. I just kind of taped that to the body of the cable. It's a little bit better look there for the stinger screws into. And this one... I'm not sure what's going on. We're we're actually a little bit confused at this point. So we cut apart the elbow, and you can see that there's a connector yeah. block built right into the elbow. That stinger slides up into that connector block, and then when the stinger screws into that block, it pushes against the, uh, that stinger. The stinger down in, it pushes against it and makes the connection. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So our newer marks were, uh, elbows pushing against it. don't have that connector block. They're just hollow we'll inside. Cut that off and skin that back. So we'll cut that off and re-terminate it. We don't have to redo the entire termination. We're just going to cut back this semiconductor. This tool here, we just call it a banana peeler. and You have a depth gauge where there's a little blade that you can adjust to hopefully I'll just cut into the in. semiconductor and not damage the insulation, the white part of the cable. The semiconductor, it's hard to remove on a good day, and this cable is extremely old. So we do have a little bit of a hard time removing that. You can see here as we get it peeled off. But it does mark the insulation up a little bit. 
ideally you don't want any marks on that insulation at all. We're gonna get a little bit closer look at that in probably another five minutes into the video. But our stores guy showed up, it's starting to warm up at the sun and we're starting to stand in water here. So we did get some plywood down in the work site. I should also mention that we are gonna be completely raising and redoing this pad mount. We're just kind of doing patchwork here today. But now you can see on the insulation, it's a lot of the semicon is pitted in there. We're gonna have to get that all removed before doing the termination. But again, we'll get we'll get back to that. Since our stores guy showed up, or actually our stores guy's not there, but our crane, our boom truck showed up. So we're gonna get this pad mount off. We also did confirm that there was no oil leaks just through a visual. So this is kind of tricky sometimes because you're lifting that off. This guy weighs 1,100 pounds. You don't want to get your hands underneath. You can see he's working from over top as he's clearing the cables because if that strap were to let go, you don't want to have that crush your arm. A little better look at the transformer pad, which is, it's not a good setup. Nowadays, there'd be a whole lot more room and it'd be a little higher off the ground. So that's all going to be changed in the summertime. And just a perfect fit for that in the back of the truck. So this device here, it's kind of like the work saver we saw when we did the 556 splice, where you adjust the depth gauge and spin it around. But the boys had a, a different version of one here. I've never used this one before. This one was really cool because as you spun it down, there was a little stopper inside the device. So it kind of bottoms out. I've never seen that one. Yeah, there's a depth through here so it stops there where you need it. Oh yeah. So once it gets to the proper depth, instead of doing that spiral cut, it completely makes a square cut huh. and it didn't mark up that copper cable at all. So that worked really well. And this is just the new the new termination that's gonna go inside the elbow here. We're gonna crimp that on. BG's 5.8s or CSA 22s. There's a variety of dies that you can use that are acceptable. You do want that little gap. You see there's a gap between the insulation yeah, and, and the, an the connector. That, uh... Because there will be some cold flow. It will creep as you crimp that. The metal is going to expand. And you don't want it to jam real tight up against that insulation. Lots of comments in the video about rotating when doing connections. A sleeve, it's almost always a must. This one here is only going to take three crimps. And the BG dies are spaced out. It doesn't, doesn't bend that connector at all. So... So just a visual here, this is the new elbow, it's going to sit down inside like that and you can see how the stinger is going to go in and basically just screw into that hole. About an inch down from that white mark you can see a hole in the stinger, that's where that little wire sticks into that you use to tighten it up. So that's what it's going to look like inside that elbow. Now our stores guys here with the new pad mount transformer. And of course, I've covered this in other videos, but you do have to check your weight for the boom, the different angles of your boom, and how far you have to ex extend. You might be able to pick it up, but if it's 40 feet away from the truck, it might not be rated for that weight anymore. Again, important to make sure you don't get your foot or arms or anything underneath that. That's the new pad mount was a little over 1100 pounds again. So we set that in place and now we're just gonna start bolting everything back together. We decided to keep the existing connectors. There was no corrosion on them at all. Oh yeah, they're, they're raised up so we can put them in. Beauty. Go anywhere, just them a little bit. Yeah. As I did mention, this this job is oh, all yeah, going to be done again. It, there was no point in us trying to raise that pad today without a little bit of planning. But this this here, this is we call this the, the tuna can. It's a little kit by 3M cable cleaning kit. It comes with uh, an alcohol swab and some sandpaper. Basically, if you do have any marks in that insulation, you don't want them to be vertical from the live portion back to the semicon. So you use the sandpaper to to brush it circular ways, get all the imperfections out, and then you use that alcohol to make sure that there's 
just dry up every bit of water that might be around that cable, clean it up, and then a little bit of silicone to keep water out once the elbow slides on. This was the blown one here, so that one goes on H1V. A little bit of silicone on the insert just helps it go on as well. When you push them on, it takes quite a bit of force. We do have a, a thumper, we call it, where you pretty much hammer the termination on, but when everything's dead like this, usually you can put it on by hand to give it a wiggle. But you can see this termination's on, it's against that set screw, but this one you can still see that red ring. You do have to make sure, usually there's a red or yellow ring, you have to make sure that elbow is fully seated. It can be a little bit hard, so I put the camera down to shove that on a little bit more. But boys are just finishing up. I see they don't have the bleeder cable on that elbow yet. I had a few other things to mark, but didn't capture a whole lot of the rest of the job. So the partner's up in the air now. We've got our permit surrendered. We removed the ground on the feed through side of the other cable. Just getting ready to close this line in and I'll be giving the engineers a call, talk to them on Monday, see what they want to do with that transformer. You can see there was quite a bit of water around it. It'd be nice to get that raised up out of the ground a little bit. Again here, and I, something I mention a lot of times in videos, just I feel it's important because I get a lot of trouble calls with arcing tap clamps where somebody didn't put them on properly, but you can see as he's tightening it, he continuously gives it a little flick just so you can see that tap clamp fully seated on that stirrup. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I believe it's the last video before this one. I cover that a little bit more in depth. My only only thing here, we don't have to measure a new termination or cable unless it's four out or above. Really, we probably should have closed this from the ground. It doesn't matter. It's not breaking any standards, closing it from the air. But when you do a new termination, it's nice to be on the ground and not eight feet away from it. But again, nothing wrong with this procedure. But thanks for watching, as always, guys. And uh, we'll... See you all soon.